first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to Gennady and to uh, Patti, to Pierre Patti. Uh, when I uh, heard this invitation, I thought that I could talk about counts because that's uh, the scaling properties, uh, uh, the pure form, in a sense. We will talk about fractional Laplacian and, and stable processes in counts, so no more scaling is possible, I think. Uh, so I enjoyed so far this conference very much, so thank you very again. My plan for this talk is that I will talk about two subjects. Uh, they are both connected with the uh, homogeneity of the Latin kernel of the pole, uh, uh, of, the, of the cone for the fractional Laplacian. I mean the Martin kernel with the pole at infinity. And the first one I will present on the, on the screen, and then I will switch to blackboard uh, and we will see how much time is left to present. The second one is uh, um, uh, a newer result with uh, other authors, but let me start with the first one. Uh, some introduction first. We call function harmonic if it uh, annihilates an uh, operator. Mm, this may be related to mean value property for uh, the corresponding Markov processes. So let's consider a Markov process with gener a generator L and the semi group PT. And then uh, we consider the first exit time of a set. This will be typical open sets. And we call a function harmonic in this other sense if it has mean value property with respect to the distribution of the process X stopped when it leaves the set B. So these definitions are um, in some general sense equivalent, but uh, one should pay attention to details. And it's easier to go from this probabilistic definition of harmonicity, which we have at the bottom of the screen, uh, to the, the definition using the generator. The other uh, direction is not so obvious. So I will consider a very special process and very special generator, namely fractional Laplacian, and then these two uh, definitions are equivalent. So we'll consider Rd. Dimension will be bigger than or equal to 2 uh, for geometric reasons. And then we'll consider the unit sphere. And the right circular cone. The right circular cone is just what we call cone usually. It will have an angle of uh, theta, that is 2 theta, if you will, the aperture. And uh, so we will denote this uh, cone by gamma theta. And the spherical cup of gamma theta is the intersection of the cone with the unit sphere. I will be interested in this talk mostly in narrow cones when theta is small. Here is a, a cone on the plane. If you will, a complex plane. So we will talk about Martin Kernel uh, for such an object, for the classical Laplacian <coughs> first. So what is the Martin Kernel? Well, let me start with examples. If we have a half plane, then the Martin Kernel is the linear function. I mean here the upper half, half plane. It is zero at the boundary. We don't care about what, uh, the values below uh, the, the boundary, uh, but that's the, the linear function, which is harmonic for the Laplacian and positive. For the first quadrant on the plane, this is the harmonic function, x times y. You see a, a homogeneous function again of degree 2, uh, and that's the Martin kernel with the polar infinity. More generally, in the complex plane, for the cone of opening 2 theta, uh, this function m given as the uh, imaginary part of c to the power of pi over 2 theta is harmonic, 0 on the boundary, and positive inside of gamma theta. So what are the important features of this ground state? This is positive and harmonic inside the cone. It is 0 on the boundary, and it's, it is homogeneous. In this case, uh, that we discuss here is homogeneous of degree beta equal to p pi over 2 theta. Homogeneity is, well, this scaling property that we have. 
So let's go to higher dimension. Again, uh, I keep this classical case of Laplacian to, uh, to understand the ideas. So here's Laplacian in spherical coordinates, in polar coordinates. And um, if we take a function phi, which is, well, um, uh, of uh, product form in those polar coordinates, then it's easy to calculate the Laplacian for such a function. And uh, assuming that the function, well, is, uh, as I said, given in, uh, as a product in polar coordinates and a homogeneous function where to that we calculate, we use this formula to calculate the Laplacian of this function phi in terms of the spherical Laplacian of the spherical profile of this function phi this the small phi is just the values of phi restricted to the unit sphere so those all terms add to this um, coefficient in front of phi and there's this spherical Laplacian, which may be uh, defined basically as the value of the, the Laplacian on phi of, cap of capital phi if lambda is equal to zero, if you want to keep it very simple. So now if we assume that this function should be harmonic, we get an eigenproblem for the spherical Laplacian. And that's a simple eigenproblem. The only small difficulty here is that in terms of lambda, there is no it's a quadratic function. So we need to solve them for this function. So if we have an eigen, eigen uh, function, an eigen value in this case, then we need to solve for lambda to say what particular value of lambda makes this function harmonic. And that's a quadratic equation. Here is a solution. I call it beta because it's exactly the homogeneity exponent that we are looking for uh, in this situation. So here's the solution. And lambda 1 is the principal eigenvalue of the, of the spherical Laplacian on the spherical cup of the cone. So that's the situation. And I want to discuss analogous uh, objects for the, uh, for the fractional Laplacian. So we already heard talks about uh, isotropic alpha stable and processes. So here is the characteristic function. Characteristic exponents psi to the power alpha. And we really want to talk about isotropic. This theory is better developed in this case. Um, we are in any dimension by this uh, rotational invariance is important. The transition density of this semigroup is uh, obtained by calculating the inverse Fourier transform of this characteristic function. And it has explicit estimates. It is uh, scaling in a nice way. It is homogeneous. And here we have the estimates. When alpha is equal to 1, we have Cauchy process. The generator. Generator will be denoted here in this presentation as delta to the power alpha half. It's the fractional Laplacian. Defined, there are many ways to define it, but the basic one to communicate is as a principal value. Uh, integral. And we are calculating the value of this operator at x, so this measures increments of the function u well, and integrates them with respect to the Levy measure, basically. I will use often this notation weekly equation sign, meaning that the ratio of two sides is between two constants, two positive constants. And C will denote various constants which depend on D and alpha. They are explicit, but I will not keep them here. So here's the setting. Again, we have uh, the semi-group, we have the process, this Markovian Levy process uh, with this transition density as we saw. That's the Levy measure. It's an example of the Cauchy process. And the, the first exit time of a set. And now this, this random variable defines many objects of interest, uh, like the harmonic measure of set D, which is the distribution of the process stop at the first exit time of D. That's the harmonicity. That's the green function defined as the expectation to be under function F up to time time D. And there are other objects of interest. Here's the picture. 
the stable process with alpha equal to 1.8, leaving a unit disk, and then we are interested in this uh, 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 quantity, the uh, position after you leave the set. And I would also like to mention the Euclid heat kernel, okay, because it will be needed in the second part of my talk. So that's, in a sense, the most basic quantity, most detailed description, analytic description of what happens in the process before the first exit time of the set D. So the Euclid heat kernel is just the transition density of the process killed after leaving D. So that's sub-probabilistic, which you can see because we subtract the quantity. This quantity has a, a, a quite clear meaning. Uh, the formula that we see here is called Hans formula. And here is an interpretation. Consider various scenarios or trajectories that this for the process go, uh, to go from X to Y. And then the, what you subtract is removed from those trajectories that uh, in the time between 0 and T leave D for whatever uh, moment of time. That's what left, and that defines the different heat kernel. So that you see some advantage of probability over analysis because it's straightforward definition rather than equation, if you will. Then this uh, the different heat kernel allows us to define various objects of interest. There are several of them. One is the green function, which is the potential. The, the other one, which is important for me in this talk, is the survival probability. So probability of surviving at least time t in a set d, that's how we write it here, when you start from x. That's a function of x and t, we can consider t fixed equal to 1, for instance, and may be interested in how this function decays in the boundary. Generally, my topic is here, uh, and often, uh, boundary behavior of harmonic functions. The whole subject is pretty old. Uh, that is, we studied this for over 10 years, uh, 15 years, yeah, over 15 years. And the cones play the role in this development. Uh, the role played by the cones is that it provides indication what the general theory should look like. There, there are often uh, algebraic identities for cones, which translate, uh, generalize in some sense, to Lipschitz domains and more general domains. So at least cons inform us, uh, inform us about a phenom phenomena that may happen. Uh, so that, that's important. And there are other objects of interest. One of them is the expected exit time, which is basically the integral of the green function with respect to one of the variables, or the integral of the survival probability with respect to t, dt. Uh, that's an important function, as we all know, that, that the work in this subject, because it's a mild risk for harmonic function. But in a sense, the, the, the survival probability is even more important because it's also a superharmonic function and it's even milder in a sense. Okay, so one motivating problem for this research is uh, the, the classical question of whether the expected exit time of a set is LP integral. And for cons, it's not obvious because it's not a does not have nice, uh, it's a bundle, of course, it's random variable, but it's, uh, you can think about scenarios of a, uh, of a process staying long in a cone and then the LP integral bit is in question. So, that's the motivating question. Uh, for which B this is fine, this expectation? So, uh, the answer uh, was provided by Brook Holder in a famous paper, Seven, and uh, he considered general counts, I mean uh, right circular counts in general dimension, and gave an answer for this critical moment of integrability in terms of the zeros of uh, some special functions. For the stable processes, uh, the first uh, attempt was made by the Blasi. It was a stable process on the plane. Zero was shown to exist, but was not specified in the paper. Then Kulczewski, using analysis, careful analysis of jumps of the stable process, 
a proof that the critical exponent of integrability is uh, smaller than one and gave a, a pretty precise bounds for how large, uh, how close to one this can be. So this is uh, a precise estimate for narrow cones. And it's a little bit striking here because for uh, the Brownian motion, the moments of integrability can be bigger than one. They are typically bigger than one. For instance, if you consider um, quadrant on the plane, the critical moment of integrability is one. And if you have narrower cone, then you can have arbitrary large critical moments of integrability. Here it's never bigger than one. It's not even equal to one. But let me show you why. The reason why is that the critical moment of integrability is equal to beta over alpha. And uh, I will explain what beta is in a moment. So here is the result and that defines beta. Uh, I need to define the Martin kernel with the polar infinity for the cone gamma, for actually arbitrary open cone gamma here and uh, the fractional Laplacian. I will often use this point one and assume that this is the cone. And here is the result. There's a unique function M which is harmonic in the cone, zero outside of the cone. It's normalized to be one at this point one. And the function then is shown to be uh, bounded, locally bounded and homogeneous of degree beta. And it is known that beta is between zero and alpha, strictly less than alpha, uh, and strictly larger than zero unless the complement of the cone is polar. So we are really talking here about general cones. I will quickly specialize to write circular cones to discuss the rest of the uh, problems that we are discussing, but this is the general result. So beta exists. Beta is to be some kind of counterpart of an eigenvalue. And I would consider M as the ground state in this case. So here are examples, actually one example. There are more, but uh, I, I just want to inform you about something here. Half space, half space, upper half space. M equal to the positive part of the last coordinate of the power alpha half is the Martin kernel that, 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 that is obtained in the general situation of that theorem. Oh, I have to know. So, if you consider the cone being complement of the hyperplane, and alpha is bigger than one, and here is the Martin kernel. And if we consider the slip plane, uh, then uh, and alpha bigger than one, then here is the beta. The general beta informs us about the, the, the boundary behavior of harmonic functions and other functions, like the heat kernel, for instance, um, at the boundary of the domain, in this, uh, in this case, of in the cone. We should say that this is somehow related to the boundary of harmonic principle, but I don't want to spend too much time on that. So in a sense, there is only one universal rate of decay in the boundary. The, the rate of decay depends on the <coughs> geometry of the boundary where we are studying the, the boundary the behavior. And in the vertex of the cone, the functions, harmonic functions de uh, decay like the distance of the origin to the power alpha. And the other parts of the boundary of a right circular cone, which are flat, basically, the decay is like that for the half space. and this with the exponent alpha over two. That's why if this is combined, we get this estimate of the Martin kernel of the right circular cone. So this is beta, the, the right hand side is also beta homogeneous and it displays the right behavior at the vertex and at the flat parts of the boundary. So the question is how to describe the, uh, how to say something more about beta? Because as you may understand, the calculus here is a little bit restricted. I mean, we don't have enough tools to calculate functions needed to give precise description of beta for arbitrary, let's say, right circular cone. 
So we just want to calculate something. And one goal was to understand the result of Kulczynski from narrow counts and how this beta behaves the function of the opening of the count when this count gets narrower and narrower. Just to see if we can actually calculate something. So here is a result with uh, Bartłomiej Szudeja and Andrzej Struz, which says that for narrow counts, beta is close to alpha minus correction uh, and constant c times theta to the power d minus 1 plus alpha plus lower order terms. So d minus 1 can be considered as the dimension of the of the historical cup, and this alpha is kind of natural. So it's not difficult to, to explain that, but well, when Kuczynski proved his result, we asked him about what he thinks is correct, the lower or upper bound. And he pointed one of them as the more precise as far as the proof goes. And it, it was actually correct, and the exponent that we get here is uh, his initial intuition or uh, proposition for us. It's also interesting that we could get this constant C explicitly. We did not expect that. Uh, namely, even for an interval, it is not known how to express explicitly or using special functions that is known functions in the vocabulary of the special functions, uh, how to express that first eigenvalue. A lot is known about this uh, this first eigenvalue, but not uh, like an explicit ex description of it. And here we had an explicit description. It was a little bit surprising. So, uh, let me say a few words about how we do this. We do this the, the, the hard way. The hard way being that we point out uh, superharmonic and subharmonic functions, and we compare uh, which are also uh, homogeneous, and we uh, and uh, we use that to uh, to estimate the, uh, this beta, this homogeneity uh, uh, exponent of the Martin term. So let me say what we know: <coughs> uh, scaling <coughs> the fractional Laplacian for homogeneous function it scales. It behaves like differentiation of order alpha. Uh, we know explicit formula for the expected exit time of a ball. It shows this, this the decay rate of alpha to the, the over two at the boundary, and for this function, it is generally known that the fractional Laplace is negative one on the set. There is some fractional calculus being developed as we speak. That it's actually more functions are now available that we know both the function and the fractional Laplacian acting on the function, which is the deal. And let me say about the decomposition of the uh, fractional Laplacian if it is applied to a homogeneous function of degree lambda. Simply speaking, fractional Laplacian is an integral operator. You can manipulate the terms in the uh, the composition that is instead of having increments of a function, you can have increments of a kernel in a sense. And that results in this decomposition. The spherical Laplacian, fractional Laplacian, measures increments of the spherical profile of a function against kernel mu zero, which corresponds to lambda equal to zero, in the sense that the function is homogeneous of degree zero. The rest is an integral operator because the singularity of this difference is simple, uh, is integrable, and uh, here's the spherical measure, sigma. Those, uh, those kernels, u lambda, they depend on lambda, they will have increment. A lot can be said about this difference, like it is negative, two ways, I don't want to talk about that. And here's a formula, which basically results from integrating along gradient. So we do have this decomposition. A problem with this R lambda is that it's not a differential operator. It's a little bit difficult to describe. So there's a question if we can kind of understand this Martin kernel in terms of uh, spectral problems. And those problems would be re uh, related. I mean, this would be general eigenproblem. I cannot speak about this today, but we will work on that. 
There are some assumptions. The spherical function of a fashion is this the operator, and this we call the radial operator, the radial operator R, R, a lambda. The strategy for estimating beta is to point out super and subharmonic functions which are homogeneous. So here's one uh, situation. If we have a function of the sphere such that this expression which corresponds to calculating fractional Laplacian for the extension of the function that should be lambda homogeneous, if this is, it has positive values as a greater, that means function is subharmonic, then lambda, this lambda is bigger than beta. So beta is actually, it should be actually small. And the other inequality goes in the other direction. If you have, in a sense, a superharmonic function, then this lambda for, uh, for which you have this negative is smaller than beta. I mean, simply speaking, super and subharmonic can be understood in the case of the half line and Laplacian, that is the second derivative. Harmonic is linear function, superharmonic would be something that is sublinear that has exponent smaller than one and subharmonic would have exponent bigger than one. That's basically the content of it. That's, um, uh, I plan to have a proof, but uh, I'm too slow for the proof. Uh, let's use this maximum principle in the sense of the sphere. So everything is reduced to the sphere. Uh, let me say about the inversion because it's one important ingredient. Namely, we really have problems with calculating fractional Laplacian of functions like those homogeneous functions. So we need to resort to some uh, calculations that are known. And as I said, we know about the expected exit time. We know the formula for the fractional Laplacian and we have this function. And in a sense, I want to um, relate this problem to the uh, um, expected exit time. So here's a kind of transformation. Namely, we start with the inversion on RD. The uh, appropriate Kelvin transformation for the isotropic stable process is given by this formula. And here's one result about how you calculate the fractional Laplacian on the Kelvin transform of the function. Uh, for instance, if function original function f is harmonic, then the Kelvin transform of this function is also harmonic. But on a different set, namely on the uh, inversion of the original set. So anyway, that's a, a explicit formula which you can which you, one can use to calculate fractional Laplacian on other functions. Just imagine a Kelvin transformation of an expected exit time and you can in principle and actually yes you can calculate how the fractional Laplacian acts on this function, taking into account that on the expected exit time you get a negative one. So that was actually an idea. Here's some information about wind function, which is equivalent, uh, but let uh, me go on. Mm. So I want to uh, reduce the problem for the cone to the problem of cylinder. Namely, a cone, uh, as it meets the, uh, the unit sphere, is flat. And it uh, crosses the unit sphere in a particular way. So it's, in a sense, similar to a, uh, uh, to a cylinder. The cylinder that I want to consider is in dimension d. That means the d minus 1 coordinates are smaller than epsilon. And I consider expected exit time of this cylinder. The situation, which can be given explicitly because there's a situation with stable process in dimension less by 1. And we have again this formula. It's good for any expected exit time on a set. We mix those ingredients, and here's a nice picture, which, uh, uh, of course, I cannot explain all the details, but here's a cone. I want to use inversion, but inversion applied to the cone gives the same cone. So I sh shift it a little bit away from zero to get something that, after inversion, uh, gives you a bounded domain, spindle-like set. And now the set is flat here, and it's very close to it. Cylinder, I take I take uh, expected exit time of a cylinder and transform it back in a sense to define a function which is homogeneous on this shifted cone and for which I can actually make the calculations and approximate integrals defining the spherical fractional Laplacian and the radial cone. So here is a hopeful spherical profile 
that I want to use to construct my super and subharmonic functions. We did struggle with this uh, project for 10 years. <laughs> it's because I will be slow, but also because I mean, those things tend to be very complicated uh, as you is estimated to us. And for this function, uh, the fraction of circle fraction of Laplace and is negative 1 plus a low order term on the experimental cap, up to the boundary. And now, uh, uh, and now the goal is to estimate the radial bar. It's a little bit easier in a sense, but uh, there is a lot of estimates. So what is important? <coughs> What's the kernel of the radial bar? Increment of this u lambda kernel. And the, the asymptotics, as lambda approaches alpha, is 1 over alpha minus lambda plus lower order terms. The two terms depend on the position of the sphere. T is basically the cosine between two angles on the sphere, two points on the sphere. So that's the basic behavior. And heuristically, this is how the radial part grows as lambda approaches alpha. So here's an estimate of the uh, of the radial part on this on our hopeful test uh, testful function that basically describes the size of the spherical cup for a narrow cone and the maximum of the function phi. So it's not, nothing special. C is explicit. Here is the main uh, contribution how it grows when lambda approaches alpha. That's alpha is a singularity for the new lambda, and the rest is smaller order terms. So how we go from that? Remember that the spherical fractional Laplacian of this function is with high accuracy equal to negative one. We want this to be equal to plus one. So how we do this? So here's the uh, radial part. We have some lower order terms which we cannot control here on the screen. And we take lambda equal to alpha minus c times t, uh, theta to the power d minus 1 plus alpha. That miraculously simplifies everything and we get 1, basically. We need to take care of constants. I oh, here's the constant. So they also cancel. So this plus 1, and the sum of those two terms is a low order term close to 0, and we can control the sign. So make it positive or negative. And then, uh, based on this lemma that I showed, but I did not explain uh, too much, uh, we can estimate beta as being larger than alpha or smaller than alpha, depending how close to this quantity we take our line. So let's test. So uh, to prepare for the, the, the second part of the talk, uh, I already said that beta describes the behavior, boundary behavior of various functions about the green function, for instance, of the cone, and about the heat kernel of the cone. And this is done through this approximate factorization. Namely, the heat kernel, the Dirichlet heat kernel of the cone, has this approximate factorization. And here, P is the transition density of the free process. And here, you have two survival probabilities. So this is as symmetric as you may wish for it. Shows all the scalings as well. And the, the survival probability is also given explicitly. Probably it's best to think about t equal to 1 here because the arbitrary t is just the result of scaling. So as you look at uh, t equal to 1, there is the behavior um, at the vertex, which is captured here, and the behavior of the boundary. So altogether, those two exponents end up at the theta, showing the homogeneity. So, our next problem that I want to discuss is to give the results about the boundary limits. So boundary limits are related to estimates. For instance, uh, they are known to be results of some self-improving property of the boundary harmonic principle in the case of the green function, for instance. Uh, but for a long time, I wondered how one can get uh, boundary limits for the heat curve. I thought that it's much more difficult, but recently it turned out that it's manageable by, by our methods. Okay. 
So here is a crown. I want to truncate this crown by a ball of radius r obtaining gamma r. The boundary harmonic principle says that if we have some negative functions which are harmonic inside gamma to r, zero outside, let's say vanish continuously at the boundary, then those two functions
that is bounded in let's say gamma one, and gamma one, let's say some page count. Then the limit as you approach the vertex. some constant times the integral of the, um, the Martin kernel with the power at, at, at zero against this function f. In a sense that's uh, kind of easy because the green function, the green uh, operator is integration of the green function against f and one just interchanges the order of integration here. Uh, the, the taking the limit, one needs only some uniform integrality. This is not too surprising, but so far we did not think it would suffice to prove uh, uh, existence of limits. But let me show an, an application. Because that's what we are talking about. This is 
on the polar, there is a sharp inequality. There's a strict, strict inequality. Okay, yes. So, it's a general question. So, for your, you assume the homogeneity, basically, that means in the real part, you have a part of the A. And in the, in the human sphere, you have a uniform, you know, in say, in your early manner. If you do put a uniform measure, you have some kind of a weight measure on that other part. Do you expect that this will work both you or? So you want other processes. Do I understand well? You want other processes? Yeah, you say if you replace your living measure by something, you still have homogeneity, but on the sphere, you don't have any measure. Okay. Yeah. Well, it looks like we need to understand Markovian situation, right? The Markovian situation. <coughs> uh, probably the cone is not a thing that we want to look at because then it's, it's not clear that. But just in general, <coughs> this has a general uh, setting. Uh, generalization is not possible. So, other stable processes, other Markov stable like processes, other processes that have boundary <coughs> type principle. Some processes with scaling, which are which would go beyond the Levy processes, for sure. Some scaling, like Thomas Simon showed yesterday, is of interest, I guess, here. I mean, it's a little bit curvilinear scaling. If you consider his uh, uh, two coordinates of Brownian motion and integrated Brownian motion. So I think all of these questions are very uh, valid. And uh, I'm just inclined to slowly work from the basis up in the building. For instance, here is an important question, how far you go from this example of right circle like on, like Lipschitz moments and so on. That's a valid question. Did you say you were studying columns in part because they helped you understand other domains? That's right. So as you have a narrower domain, meaning that it's inside the cone, locally, the decay rate, uh, is how fast your process go, goes out, is uh, faster, right? So the functions, how many functions decay faster at the top. So that's one comparison with which domains. Or if you have an exterior cone for your domain, then you can also compare it. And also, this suggests some approximate scaling uh, methods that you can use to study the which or other domains. Yeah. Plenty of options to consider other domains. Not everything would go as smoothly as here for the cone. For instance, if the set is very thin in some boundary point, then I don't think there will be a proper expression law from that point. And probably the process will behave like waiting there <coughs> until it jumps inside and then it starts evolving by the process. And this is understood to a large extent in the elliptic case. So far, we thought that the parabolic case would be much more difficult. Maybe it's not so bad. OK, any other questions? OK, let's thank Professor once again.